Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 7. We have been steadily making our way through Matthew's gospel. We find ourselves now at chapter 7. We are in the third of the three chapters that are commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And one thing that we have learned throughout this incredibly important and incredibly well-known passage of Scripture is the value of context. They say that realtors will tell you the importance of location, location, location. And when it comes to the Bible, it's equally important that we remember context, context, context. It's just so crucial. And as we go look back through what we've done, you can't understand the Lord's Prayer that is so famous and well-known without seeing it in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. You can't understand the end of chapter 5 without understanding the Sermon on the Mount. The passages that say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You can't understand the Beatitudes outside the context of the, the preliminaries leading into the Sermon on the Mount. There's so much here contextually that is important for us to know and understand, otherwise we get things wrong. Now, I know most of you know this, so why do I emphasize it today? Particularly because today, friends, we come to the atheist's favorite Bible verse. They love this verse. You, you can say, if you're on social media and you say something that somebody disagrees with, you don't even have to mention God. They'll go and check your profile and see if you mentioned God sometime three and a half years ago. And then once they know that you are Team Jesus they will respond with that absolute death blow that you will never recover from. Judge not. Doesn't the Bible say, judge not? And with those two words, they throw their knockout punch and they walk away victorious. They love that verse. Of course, words can mean anything outside of their context. You could say to somebody, would you like to have a cup of coffee this morning? And they say, I'd rather not. And then if you're asked that someone is talking later about some important theological point and a Christian should do this, ah, but I heard him earlier and he said, I'd rather not. And suddenly we've gone from coffee to theology and everything's a mess and the person has been completely misrepresented. So as we come to this famous passage of scripture, I wanted us to start today with this ringing in your ears. Context, context, context. So let's deal, before we come to the context, with just the most basic principle here. Should Christians ever judge? And the answer is emphatically, consistently, throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, yes, yes, yes. Pretty much every letter written to the church, with very few exceptions, is dealing in some way, shape, or form with false doctrine. And in some of the letters... The false teachers are absolutely center stage with regards to the entire purpose of the book. When we taught through the book of Colossians, we noted that while so often people refer to the false teachers at Colossae, that actually Paul only ever uses the singular. That there may have been just one person teaching bad doctrine, and Paul writes an entire letter warning the church about that kind of teaching and that teacher specifically. Can you imagine how Paul would have responded if you turned to him and said, Ah, Paul, I know he's not your cup of tea, but do not judge. We are clearly supposed to judge and be able to say, this person is a false teacher and this person is a good teacher. And the fact that so many Christians are incapable of doing that today, so many professing Christians, 
is only only goes to show just how much the atheistic interpretation of these verses has somehow infiltrated the church. For any Christian ever to quote this verse when somebody is trying to correct you with scripture is despicable. Absolutely despicable. May it never be true of any of us. Judgment begins in the house of God. We're told in 1 Peter. And I mean, I could and give you a whole long list of this verse says don't, you, you must judge this, this verse says you must judge that. But I think anybody with even the vaguest understanding of Scripture knows that there are times where we have to say, that's wrong. That's right. And each of those statements are judgments. I am judging what you have said, and my conclusion is, you are wrong. I am judging what you've said, and my conclusion is, bravo, that's right. We are supposed to make those judgments. So let me leave you with one verse just echoing in your ears, which is a very important verse that will be more and more important as time goes by, which is Isaiah 5 verse 20, which says, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Woe to you, says the Lord, if you declare something that I have said is good is in fact evil, or something that I have said is evil is in fact good. And therefore, we are required to make judgments of what is good and evil. Constantly. And if you are someone who professes the name of Christ, and you are living in this world here today, and your concern is that you wouldn't offend your workmates, that you wouldn't be disliked by your neighbors, let me be absolutely frank with you. You've already lost. You are already compromised. You have already capitulated. We have to be people who are prepared to make judgments. We have to make judgments. We cannot ever find ourselves in the situation where God says, this is a wicked thing, and we as Christians are found to say, well, you know, I guess it's not really ideal, but, you know, this day and age, when I see people behaving that way, the onus is on them to convince me that they're a Christian moving forwards. Because that kind of talk, that kind of behavior, how does that fit in to the Beatitudes? To somebody who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. To someone who mourns over sin. You can't, you can't have those verses describe you when you are making allowances for sin. When you're playing down the severity of sin. And when you're more concerned about a comfortable existence and the world loving you than you are about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Or, as we saw last week, seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. So all of that to say is that when we come to this verse that says, do not judge, the one thing we absolutely categorically know from the context of the Bible in its entirety is that there are times, more often than not, when we absolutely have to judge. So immediately, what do you do? And this is a, a golden rule for those of you who are younger in the faith. This is a golden rule of Bible interpretation. So hear this. Do not allow the things that are clear and consistent in Scripture be overruled by isolated passages that don't seem as clear. So in other words, then, you know, the Bible might say lots and lots and lots of, 
you know, lots of times one particular thing, and there's another verse that seems to suggest that might not be the case. You don't jettison all that clear, consistent teaching for the one obscure passage. You don't take this verse and say, well, it just says do not judge, don't pay attention to the context, and somehow jettison all the rest of Scripture that clearly tells us that in many circumstances we must. You must judge me. You have to judge me. You're required to judge me. If my teaching is not in accordance with Scripture, you shouldn't be here. Go somewhere where it is. And I have to judge you. How can I be someone who, who rebukes you over sin if I can't make those kind of judgments? And we all, as a body, are responsible for edifying and encouraging one another when we do right. And all of us are responsible for rebuking our brothers and sisters when we find them in sin, lest that sin spreads through the body as yeast does through a loaf of bread. So we will judge and we must judge. So what then do we do when we come across a passage like this? We look at the context. So let's get into it and let's have a look at the context. The words in verses 1 and 2, I think, are fairly clear in what they say. So let's start there. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For what, uh, for, sorry, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you measure, it will be measured to you. Now, one thing we have seen throughout the Sermon on the Mount is that you cannot fully understand it without understanding the social context in which it's in. Most specifically, Jesus is speaking to people who are Jews, who have repented of their sin, and they have turned away not only from their sin, but the, from the sinful system that had taken over Judaism. The Pharisaic Judaism of the day was wicked and it was wrong. It was, as we have seen through chapters 5 and 6, it was a system that declared itself to be righteous but had no concern for righteousness. It was a system where they went through and they checked boxes and they were, check, 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 yep, I'm righteous and I'm more righteous than you. Rather than humbling themselves, recognizing their sinfulness and mourning over their sin and living their life in pursuit of the righteousness that God calls us to. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, we have references that don't make a lot of sense outside of Pharisaic Judaism and clearly are pointing to it. The most obvious section was the end of chapter 5. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, most of you were there for that sermon, but for those who weren't, suffice to say, when it says, we, uh, you have heard, it is making reference to what is called the oral law, what you hear. The oral law was spoken and heard, and that is to contrast with the written law, which was written down from ages past. Now, ironically, the oral law was written down as well, but the reason it was called that is because there was the law that was written from way back because Moses wrote it down inspired by God. And then the Pharisees came along and said, well, Moses said this, but what about that? Moses said this, but what about that? And they added and 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 they added more rules. And the, the example I always use for this, because it's one of the best ones, is when in the Mosaic law it says not to boil a, a kid, baby goat, in its mother's milk. And the reason for that was because it was part of the, 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 the system of worshipping a false god that was happening in that region at that time. 
And, and so you mustn't be doing those false acts of worship. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. And then the, the Pharisees, the, the rabbis, they, which is what they were, they, they, they're analyzing the law and they're saying, well, if I were to eat a piece of meat and then I were to drink a glass of milk afterwards or wash it down with a glass of milk, can I be certain that the meat that I ate is not a goat that came from the mother whose milk I'm drinking? And as they curdle in my stomach, am I perhaps boiling them in some way? And so, okay, okay, we've got to be careful. Now, most of the time that won't happen, but on a very rare occasion it will. So now we have a new rule that says, do not eat meat and drink milk at the same time. And then they say, well, well hold on a second. What happens if we have cheese with our meat? Some sort of burger into a cheeseburger. What happens if we have cheese with it? That that's been curdled from the milk. Yeah, no, okay, cheese as well. Okay, we'll do cheese as well. But what happens then if we, if we have meat, one meal, and then when we leave it, we just leave it to digest, and then we have cheese maybe later in the day or the next day, but a little morsel of meat got left on the plate, didn't get brushed off. Oh no, that would be terrible, because then we'd be breaking the rule about the meat and the cheese, so now we're going to have to have separate plates for meat and cheese. And guys, in the most ultra-orthodox circles to this day, they have separate plates and cutlery for meat and dairy. And that is why. And what happens is there is a law that Moses gave, given by God, and then man comes along and says, well, we can't break this law, so here's another law to keep us away from it. A fence law, we call them. And fence laws are sometimes okay. The problem with the Pharisees is, is that they now made that fence law of equal authority. So the way that the laws got progressively stricter is because they were never going back to Moses. They were always dealing with the most recent law as if that had the same degree of authority. So the oral law was the law that the Pharisees were, were, were saying. And because they couldn't be contradicted, they said, well, the law that we have, our additional rules, they come from God too, but Moses never wrote them down. But they're kind of passed down orally. So in other words, what they were doing is they said, here's the law of Moses, here's our laws, and they now have equal authority. The written law, the word of God, and the oral law, the laws of man. And so Jesus in Matthew 5, he's coming along and saying, you've heard all these additional rules and regulations, and they're wrong. I'm going to put it right for you. And what Jesus shows is there's a whole bunch of rules that were given that you don't have to keep. But more importantly... That by keeping man-made rules, you can avoid actually pursuing the very righteousness that the law was trying to get you to pursue. And so the Pharisees, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, they really aren't even remotely righteous at all, though they claim to be. But they become righteous because they take the law of Moses and they go, check, 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 while ignoring the righteousness of that law. In other words, I've never committed adultery, but let's not worry about lust. We can check those boxes. And then, on the other hand, they have all these additional rules that they keep, and if you don't keep them, you're the bad guy. How dare you not keep, how dare you eat cheese with your meat? How could you do such a thing? And they had elevated their laws. And you see that in the Gospels where it's a case of, well, hey, you know, our disciples that, you know, are, are, are fasting and, and what have you, but your disciples aren't. Even John the Baptist's disciples did, but your disciples aren't doing that. In other words, we are judging you because you're not meeting our standards. Oh, I think we're getting there now, aren't we? What is the consistent thing throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, 
What is the consistent thing that underlines, underpins all the multitude of verses where we are commanded to judge? For example, let's take our, our, our passage that we referenced earlier, Isaiah 5 verse 20. Woe to you who call good evil and evil good, right? Woe to you if you call good evil and evil good. Well, if I say that something is good, how am I to know if it is good or I've just assigned goodness to something that's actually evil? H how do I know? Well, the answer in the context of Isaiah is, has God called it good? Because if God's called it good, we must call it good. And if God's called it evil, we must call it evil. And, and how dare we muddle those things up? So how do we know what God has called it? We know from his word. That's it. So judging should always come on the basis of the Bible. Judging should always come on the basis of the Bible. And if we say to someone, hey brother, hey sister, I love you dearly, but I see that you're doing this with your life, doesn't the Bible say this? That kind of judgment is not only okay, it's absolutely necessary for a church to be healthy and to function as it should. If you want to go to a church that nobody will ever tell you you're doing anything wrong, where you can live however you like, sing the songs, come feel good, have a sermon that tells you you're doing okay, hang in there, God's got you, all that kind of stuff, this is not that church. Don't leave now, that would be embarrassing for us all, but maybe later, just go. Just don't come back again. Because that's not how churches are supposed to function. They are, there are big Christian, Christian social clubs that function like that, that call themselves churches. And, and the, the main goal each week is you come in from a hard week and you come to church on Sunday and you essentially need a high five. A high five from God, a high five from the church, just to tell you, you got it. You got it, guy. We got your back. Everything's good. And you go out to the next week ready to, to press on. That's not what church is. We are supposed to judge one another on the basis of the word of God. But the Pharisees, they judged one another on the basis of their man-made rules. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul calls man-made rules, traditions of men, to be doctrines of demons. When I first came to this church, I had an interview for the job. This is seven, seven and a bit years ago now, seven and a half years ago. I had an interview, and I said to them, you know, I said, you know, anything else you want to tell us? Anything else we need to know about you? I said, you need to know that I loathe legalism. I loathe it. Okay, all right, okay, I understand that. And I said, no, 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 no. I think you heard me say that I didn't like legalism. Some of you will be thinking Ron Swanson here, and those who know, you're on the right, right lines. You know, you may have heard me say, I don't like legalism. Legalism is not something we should do. I, I didn't say that. What I said is, I loathe it. I, I simply will not tolerate it. We cannot have it. We will not, I, I, just not on my watch. We can't do that. And one of the things that this church had when I arrived was it had a uh, part of the membership of this church was a covenant that said that you had to, uh, that you weren't allowed to consume or even sell alcohol if you were going to be a member of this church. Now, drunkenness is a sin. Absolutely, it is. And if somebody comes into church on Sunday morning with a really bad hangover, okay, <laughs> there's a basis for rebuking. You'll find it in the Word of God, right? But for someone to have a beer with their friends or to have a glass of wine with their meal, and I know not everybody is able to ha have the consistency where they can do that and control it, but for someone to do that is not sinful. 
Jesus turned water into wine. And I know if you've been in Baptist churches all your lives, someone would have told you that was grape juice. It wasn't. And there's good contextual reasons to know that. And so legalism and man-made rules have no place in the church of God because they are, they are sourced from demonic minds. That isn't to say that everybody who, who has legalism is demonic. What I'm saying is false doctrine is demonic in its very nature. If someone says Jesus is not God, that's demonic. That doctrine hasn't come from God. And when people start to give us man-made rules, then that is a demonic doctrine. That is false teaching. Just, just as much as it is wrong to get doctrine wrong, it's wrong to add rules that Scripture doesn't add. It's wrong to have man-made righteousness, man-made checklists for righteousness, because not only do those things not make you righteous, if you choose not to have a glass of wine with your meal and someone else does choose, that says nothing about the righteousness of either of you. Not only does it not communicate what is righteous, but almost always man-made rules are a cover for avoiding true righteousness. And that's what we found with the Pharisees and we will see again and again and again and again. Man-made rules have no place. And so whether it is do not drink, whether it is so many of these kind of churches were back in the day, do not dance, only use this Bible version. Ladies, make sure you don't show any more on your ankles. Well, maybe not even the ankles, actually. You know, all of that kind of stuff. Just run a mile from that legalism. Pursue godliness as outlined by Scripture. And the Pharisees did not do that. And that's the context of the Sermon on the Mount. So when the Pharisees, when, when we have that context, and we're told, do not judge that you, you will not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, is basically saying, if you judge by a certain set of rules, they're the set of rules that you will be judged by. And this, this is a Jewish... Uh, well, the Jewish idiom is in the next verse where it says, um, and with what measure you measure, it will be measured to you. That is a very Jewish way of thinking. It's something that, that is presented in many places in the gospel when Jesus says, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. You, you go on this road, you're on this road. You have the sword, you, you want to kill people with the sword, you'll probably get killed by a sword. You want to judge people by these standards, you're going to get judged by those standards. That's a very Jewish way of thinking, and it's presented to us here in a positive context. In other words, what it's saying is this it's not saying don't ever judge anybody under any criteria. What it's saying is, when you judge people by a certain criteria, that criteria will, will be what you are judged by. And in the context of a Sermon on the Mount, he's saying to these guys, you've got to get away from Pharisaic Judaism. This, this toxic misrepresentation of Mosaic law, get away from it. And you've got to get rid of it completely, because if you don't get rid of it completely, it's going to come back and affect you as well. How do we apply this to us as Christians today who are not under Mosaic law and who aren't surrounded by Pharisaical rabbis? How do we apply this today? Well, here's one example, and you could think of many others, no doubt. If you sit with a group of friends... And you say, hey, you know, you know so-and-so, I prefer so-and-so now, I used to use names, and then a couple of times I realized we have visitors with those names, and it was like, I wasn't intending to point a finger, so it's just going to be so-and-so now, okay, because there's visitors and I don't know all your names, so, okay. So you, you're sitting around with your friends and you say, hey, you know so-and-so, one of you says, did you know that so-and-so did X? Okay? Now, if so-and-so did X, then that is neither gossip nor slander, nor anything problematic. Did you know that so-and-so so -and -so did X? Okay. I wonder why he did X. I, I, I wonder, I, do you think he probably was motivated because of blah, 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 blah. 
And, and he's doing X because his heart is like this. And therefore, we can expect him to do Y as well fairly soon. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be wise to the nature of people and that people's characters don't get exposed and that people with certain characters have a degree of consistency in those characters. I understand that. But I don't know. If, if you do something, sometimes that tells me something about your heart. But other times I'm just guessing. And how do we know the distinction? Scripture. It's really simple. Scripture. You know? Like we can say, look, you killed someone. Yes, that's a fact. I killed someone. So there was hate in your heart. Oh, I'm not really sure that there was. I think there was. There was hate in your heart. The Bible says so, right? So I think we can safely make those kind of assumptions. But if somebody doesn't invite you to their birthday party, and you're like, oh, they must really hate me. They didn't invite me to their birthday party. You know? And, and then we go down these trails, don't we, sometimes? And they probably hate me because I said this th th then. And, and I didn't mean that, but they probably understood it that way. And they're just that kind of person. And, and now you're like 10 steps down the line, and you've done a complete character assassination of this person, all on the basis that they didn't invite you. And then you find out next month that, it, that the invitation got lost in the, in the mail. And, and, you know, and then you say, oh, oh, sorry, I got it wrong. And you forget about it like nothing happened. None of us want to be judged that way. You shouldn't be judging people on the basis of guessing what they're thinking. You must judge people in this church on the basis of their actions. You must. How else do we keep sin away from us? You must. You judge people's actions according to the standard of Scripture. But what we don't do is we don't judge motivation, we don't judge thinking, we don't judge what's going on in their heads or in their hearts unless their actions specifically expose that according to Scripture. And we don't judge people by a standard that isn't held by Scripture. We don't. And it may well be that you can't have a glass of wine with your meal, so don't. Go with your convictions, Romans 14. But don't impose that on other people. You may not be comfortable watching that TV show, but somebody else might. You don't know if they don't fast forward that bit that they shouldn't watch. Just presume the best of them. Presume that they do. And I think there's just this reality where some of us, not all of us, but some of us are coming from church backgrounds that are so Deep in legalism, it can be really hard for us to let go of it. I like to presume the best of people until they presume me wrong, until they prove me wrong. I like to presume the best of people. And if I'm wrong, they'll prove me wrong. And that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, you, who do you trust, who do you not trust? You're always making judgment calls. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. What I'm simply saying is, is that the standard by which you're going to judge other people is the standard by which you should expect to be judged. And, and you've got to be okay with that. And we judge people according to scripture, but we don't judge people according to man-made rules. And the fact that he's talking specifically about the Pharisees, if anybody has been with us from the beginning of chapter 5, this is going to be obvious to you. But if it's not yet obvious to others, it will become clearer as we go by. Look at the next verse, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? What do we, what is the, what's, what do we have in common between the speck, or some verses, verse, uh, versions say splinters, and the log? There's, there's, a, there's one thing that's the same, and there's one thing that's different. The thing that's different is obvious. It's the size, Right? A huge log is obviously very different than a, than a splinter. But there's, there's something they have in common, and that is the material. They're made from the same material. They're both wood. Right? Whether you've got one little piece of wood or a huge piece, it's still wood. That's the measure and the measure. Now, what's the effect 
of you having a little splinter of wood in your eye and, and, and having a log in your eye? What, what, what other commonalities are there? Well, no matter whether you have a log in your eye or a splinter in your eye, a speck in your eye, you can't see. You can't see. So if, if, you, if you've got a, a speck in your eye, you've got a bit of wood in your eye, you can't see through that eye now because of the irritation of that. So how can you clearly make out what's in other people's eyes? And of course, there is an exaggeration here to make a point, which is when you've got a log in your eye, you can't see at all to see the speck or the splinter in another person's eye. Now, the material is the same, and therefore the basis of judgment. But this cannot be seen outside the context of the Pharisees previously, where the Pharisees are saying, you're righteous, you're righteous, you're righteous, you're righteous. And Jesus has been showing, you Pharisees are so far removed from the pursuit of righteousness that you cannot even begin to understand what righteousness really looks like. So how then do we understand this? What we understand is this, is if you're going to go in the Pharisaic system of, of judging other people's righteousness, you are going to completely miss the fact that you are not righteous yourself. And friends, I have seen that in legalistic churches, including this one in the early days. So many times where there are people that will criticize and there are people who have problems. And honestly, I've been in ministry, I've been in full-time ministry for over 20 years. And I have seen church splits, I have seen problems, I have seen fights, I've seen bickering, I've seen all-out conflict. And 90% of the time, it never revolves around biblical doctrine. It revolves around, I want it done this way, or why can't you do this, or why can't this person do worship and not that person, and why can't it be done my way and not your way, and I don't like this and I want that, and I think your motive is bad, and perhaps you're doing this wrongly. <gasps> ah! Churches are, are destroyed by this kind of thinking. Relationships are destroyed. And most sadly of all, is. People who profess Christ bring shame on him through this kind of thinking. We don't know people's motives unless they tell us. We can't judge people by a, a standard of, oh, well, you should do it this way, not that way. Well, where's that in the scripture? Because ultimately that would just come back on us. And the reality is, is that when we are doing that, we're showing our own inability to judge righteousness. We're showing our inability to judge what truly is righteous because we are pursuing righteousness the wrong way. If someone criticizes you for something that is, you know, in a spiritual context, for something that isn't clearly unbiblical, they are simply showing that their perception of righteousness is not based on the Bible. I saw again the other day a, a little chart somebody shared of, you know, various skirt lengths for the ladies and how, 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 how your righteousness should be. Oh, you're showing your ankle, you know. Oh, maybe you can just about get, oh, now you're showing a little bit of your calf. Now, now, now Satan's, you, your team Satan now, that kind of thing, you know. And, and I'm, all, I'm all for people dressing appropriately for church and for anything else. I'm all for people... Um, not causing other people to stumble. I'm not suggesting that at all. But what I'm saying is, is that there again is a classic church-based system of righteousness that finds itself as much in the, the social um, context of the church, which is often run by old people who have rules that were more in accordance with the 1950s or whatever particular, you know, America as opposed to, I don't know, the Europe as opposed to, Africa as opposed to Asia and all those different cultures and, and they're making these assessments of righteousness. Don't do that. Let the Bible be our guide and only the Bible. And, and what's going to happen when we judge people by a standard of righteousness that is not biblical, we end up proving that we ourselves don't understand what righteousness is. Now, let me say one more thing about that while we're on that train of thought. 
When someone criticizes you, it can be soul crushing. And some of us are more sensitive to that than others. Some people are just like, ah, oh, you don't like me, I don't care, gonna get on with my life. Never think about it again. Other people, they say, do you like my new shirt? It's all right, you know. And then they're crushed for the next five years. We're, we're all different kinds of people, and, and you know, um, we are impacted by this maybe differently. But if somebody says something to you negative, it can be something that can really kind of like affect some people. What, what do you do in that situation? The first thing you do is this. You humble yourself and say, is there any truth to this? And if there is truth to it, it has to be something that can be argued biblically. Okay? So I don't like the way that you did that. Okay, where is that in Scripture? And if it is in Scripture, if someone's saying you shouldn't do this and the Bible says you shouldn't do this and you're doing it, you've got you to take the hit. And you've got to recognize that that criticism was an act of love. And some people communicate these loving criticisms more lovingly than other people <laughs> communicate them. Some people aren't the best communicators and maybe say things a little bit more harshly than they should or what have you. But the fact that someone exposes our sin is an act of love, regardless of anything else. But and this is the point I'm coming to. From these verses here, we can conclude this. If somebody judges you and criticizes you, and it seems that the basis of their judgment is either their presumption of something that you, you, you're supposed to have thought or you're supposed to be motivated by that they have no, no knowledge of, or they're holding you to a standard of righteousness that somehow is completely alien to the Bible, then what's happening is that somebody with a log in their eye is saying, you've got a speck in yours. And you know what you do in that situation? You laugh and you shake it off. Don't allow your life to be impacted by people who can't see what righteousness is. And let's make it our business to be people who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who want to be all that God wants us to be, that we might genuinely be able to help other people who are struggling on their path. Because it's not that we just never ever judge anyone. It's, it's, look at verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, when you look at the big picture in this verse, in this passage contextually, it's not saying, don't ever say to someone to take the thing out of their eye that's making them not able to see. What it's saying is you've got no basis to do that when you've got a freaking log in your own eye. Don't do it. Sort yourself out. In other words, and this is crucial, in this context, the original hearers of Jesus speaking these words is hearing this. Don't worry when the Pharisees criticize you. And don't be like them. Don't worry what the Pharisees say. You know, there are people who when you say something that is wise and loving and helpful will tell you that you are wicked and awful and a bigot or whatever else. They don't know what righteousness is. They've got a redwood sticking out of their eye. So why would you be concerned when they say, oh, with my eye, I see a problem in your eye. And it's like, well, You've, you've, you've got like, you know, you've got a whole forest in your eye. I mean, what, what are you talking about? Why, don't be bothered by that. But equally, don't be that. Be someone who judges what is righteous and unrighteous on the basis of Scripture and on the basis of Scripture alone. That's what this passage is teaching us. And can I just point out the obvious irony at this point? The atheist when they don't like you saying something that is in harmony with Scripture, is pointing to a passage of Scripture that emphasizes the importance of judging in accordance with Scripture. In other words, the passage is saying the exact opposite of what they think it is saying. In fact, what they're doing in criticizing you is exactly what this passage is warning people about. 
Don't judge by standards that don't come from God, but rather come from man. The very passage they quote, the verse, the half verse normally, is something that condemns themselves. And so we come to verse 6, which is where we will end today. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You see, when you, when you don't understand the context, some of this section can seem almost what musicians would call staccato. Here's a boom and a boom and a boom and a boom. It's just like, a, it's just like here's a verse and here's a do not and here's a do. And that somehow they're kind of unrelated. But when you understand the context, you see how it flows. We're talking here about people who don't know how to judge righteously because the standards that they have are wrong. And we're talking here about not being concerned about the, the judgments of those who aren't themselves pursuing righteousness. And so in verse 6, it fits perfectly and it makes perfect sense in the context in that it says, don't give this righteousness to those who will trample on it. Now, I know many of you, like myself, are animal lovers. You, like me, may watch far too many videos of rescue dogs on social media. You know the ones, the dog's been found, they're covered in fleas, they've got a broken leg, and then you go and you rescue them, and by the end of the video, the dog is running around, it's the happiest thing in the world, and the tears are streaming down your cheeks. Guilty as charged. But in the Bible, and in this era, at this time, in this geographical location, dogs were vermin. They were scavengers, and they weren't, not, they weren't nice. They weren't animals that you could say, here, come here, little boy, let me give you a pet Fido, you know, let me stroke you, give you, a, give you a little bit of a treat. They bite your hand off. And they were considered to be, as we might consider to be, the coyotes that come down from the Verdugos. And the, the city constantly remind us, haze them, scare them off, don't feed them. And I remember a story years ago, a different location in California, where some high school girls thought it would be a great idea when the coyotes came down to their cross-country practice to feed them little bits of burgers. And so they went to McDonald's, and every practice they buy like 10 burgers for a buck each, and they'd be giving out these bits of burgers to, to the coyotes. And of course, the coyotes got more and more comfortable and got closer and closer, and eventually somebody got bitten, then the coyote had to be shot. They were just, they're just scavengers, these dogs. So if it helps you as a Burbankian, to read here coyote rather than dog, so you're not thinking about your favorite golden retriever, then just go ahead and be my guest and just think coyote. The point is, I don't, think, I don't think as many of you will have problems with pigs and swine here. I used to keep pigs, and they are some of the most intelligent and amazing and clean animals you could ever have. They're, as clever, they're cleverer than those cats that you idolized, trust me. But... Less of you will have a problem with that. But the point is that both of these animals are wild animals. And the idea is simply this. That if you go and give something valuable to a wild animal, it's going to trash it. And so you don't give what is holy to dogs. What, what is holy in this context? We know what's holy in this context. It's the righteousness of God as outlined by Scripture. That's what's holy. Dogs are just going to trample over it. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I don't think we should ever quote scripture to unbelievers. But they're going to trample on it. We, we, don't, we don't give your, your, your grandmother's expensive pearls to a pig who doesn't understand the value of it. So I think there is a place where when we're in conversation and, and, and we're connecting with those in the world around us who are unbelievers, that we can communicate biblical principles. I don't think quoting verses with the King James Version is perhaps the best way of doing that, but we can communicate the concepts, right? I'm sorry I can't partake in this because the Bible says that is wicked and I can't be doing that. Those kind of conversations, I think, are helpful. And many of you in this day and age need to be in the business of doing that so at your place of work you can put your non-compliance with their ideologies in harmony with your biblical beliefs. 
If you just simply say, no, I don't want to do that, you can lose your job. And if you say, no, I don't want to do that because I'm a Christian and the Bible says, then you're now protected in your job. That's an important thing for people, I think, in the coming years. So there is a place, I think, for saying, well, Scripture says this. But guys, if any of you have sat down and had a three-hour conversation with a Jehovah's Witness who knocks on your door about the intricacies of the eschatology of the book of Daniel, you will realize what an astonishing waste of time it is. Yes, I did that in my 20s. Sat down for three hours and we went through the book of Daniel and what have you. And it really frustrated me. But I explained it so well. I showed them that they were wrong. Why couldn't they see it? You know why they can't see it? Because there's a log in their eye. They're absolutely blind and their assessment of what righteousness is, is not the same as ours. They don't accept the authority of scripture. And I learned that lesson quite quickly. And so by the end of my 20s, I remember Jehovah's Witnesses coming and knocking on the door. And we sat down and I said, you know, the Bible's the word of God, it has authority. And they went, oh yeah, the Bible's the word of God, it has authority. And we really believe in the Bible. Oh yeah, yeah, we really believe in the Bible. And I said, well, if we both believe in the Bible, we should sit down and open up the Bible and we should talk about the Bible together and see what it says. She said, yeah, that would be a great idea. Let's do that. And I said, that would be fantastic. Let's book a time. Okay, let's book a time. So I, the Jehovah's Witness said, well, how about this time and this day? I said, fine, that time, that day. Come along. Let's open up the Bible. Let's look together and see what it says. And they said, fine, I'll see you on that day at that time. And as he left, I said one more thing to him. I said, hey, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, whatever his name was. I said, you won't come back. He said, what do you mean? I said, you won't come back. He says, I will. I gave you my word. My word is solemn. I don't lie. I'm going to come back. I said, you won't come back. Let me tell you why you won't come back. You won't come back because the people that you report to, when you go back and the people who are knocking on the doors across the street, the people who are down the next street or wherever the, the team leader is, or when you report back, they will tell you, do not go to this man's house and do the Bible with him. Because they know you've got to be fearful of Christians who know their Bibles. And they will tell you not to come. And I said to him, I want you to know this and understand this, Mr. Jehovah's Witness. When you don't come back, when you specifically told me that you will come back, and that you've lied to me by saying you will come back, when you don't come back, I want you to understand this. You have proven by not coming back that your authority is not in the Bible it's in the society, in the group, in the organization who you are subservient to. That's where your authority lies. And they outrank the Bible. So when they say the Bible doesn't mean that, it means that, then you will bow to that authority. Don't waste your time going through details of biblical theology with people who are blind. But what you must do is point them to the log in their own eye. You're blind, you can't see, you need the gospel. You say that Jesus isn't God, but he is. And if your Jesus isn't God, then he can't save, because only a Jesus who is God can save. And so we can tell people these key truths. We can have people foaming at the mouth in anger towards us because of our apparent bigotry. And we can just simply say, do you know what? There's a God. He created the heavens and the earth. And I look at creation around me. I know that there's a God. And I am, I am duty bound to, to worship and to give glory and honor to the one who gives me life. Because apart from him, I have no life. And so I must do what he says, and I cannot call good what he calls evil, and I cannot call it evil what he calls good. I have to bow my knee before him. You've said all you need to say. You're done. Don't get into five-hour conversations. Don't take grandma's pearls and throw them before the swine. Don't waste your time. But always preach the gospel. Always point people to a sovereign God who in his love sent his son to die in our place for our sins that we might be forgiven. Always point to the gospel. You know why? Because that is the thing that removes logs. And that is the thing that opens the eyes of the blind. 
when God sovereignly ordains it, the youngest person here, the oldest person here, the least articulate person here, the person with the least command of the English language here, you can stutter and slip up and just blah, 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 and somehow get some remnant of the gospel out. And when God ordains it, a miracle can happen and a person who was blind can see. And they will suddenly recognize that God is sovereign and his righteousness is all that matters. And everything changes. So no throwing pearls. No getting into long arguments with people who judge differently than we. If someone rejects the Bible, don't try and argue with them on the basis of the Bible because they reject the Bible. But at the same time, present the, what the scripture says, present the gospel, shake the dust from your feet and walk away. And maybe, just maybe, if we cry out to God for their souls, he would sovereignly open their eyes so that they too might be able to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to mourn over their sin and to repent and to turn and to submit to God who is the only one who gets to define good and evil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the warnings contained here. May we never allow our approach to the faith to be corrupted by man-made rules and traditions. May we never hold people to a standard of righteousness that the Bible doesn't. And Father, may we be people who do hunger and thirst for righteousness. May we not be like the Pharisees checking boxes and thinking that we're okay, but may we seek the best of people. May we seek to do right by people. And may we seek to do it all so that you might be glorified in our lives. Amen.